Horns up and welcome to Headbangers Kitchen. We've got a great show for you guys today. I'm going to be cooking up a demanufactured mutton biryani. And why is it demanufactured? Well, that's because I'm getting to feed my idols Fear Factory on the show today. This is a band that I grew up listening to, so for me, it's a great honor. And as for the biryani, now I'm making my own version of a biryani. And this is the first time I've ever made a biryani. In fact, I did a lot of research and there seem to be a lot of biryani purists out there who call people names on YouTube and say all kinds of nasty things just because the biryani is not authentic enough. So, my biryani is my very own demonic demanufactured biryani. So, I'm not making a Hyderabadi biryani, I'm not making a South Indian biryani, I'm not making a Calcutta biryani, I'm making a demonic biryani, a demonic demanufactured biryani. And my biryani is going to have mutton and potatoes and it's going to be delicious. So let's make that demanufactured mutton biryani. So we're going to start making our mutton biryani by marinating our mutton. And uh, you know they say you should always cook mutton biryani with mutton on the bone. But I don't know something about boneless mutton biryani just appeals to all my senses. So I'm using a boneless cut of mutton here. I'm using about 500 grams. So to marinate the mutton. I'm going to first start with a good amount of salt. There's nothing more unappealing than saltless meat. So I've put a good helping of salt in here. I'm going to put in two teaspoons of ginger garlic paste, the juice of half a lime, some black cumin or shahi jeera. I'm going to also put in some jeera powder or cumin powder. I'm going to add some red chili powder and some coriander powder. Now that's not all. There's a lot that goes into this biryani. So I'm going to add some coriander, fresh coriander, some fresh mint leaves, some ghee. This is very important because this is going to be at the bottom of the pan. So it's going to need some of that ghee to stop it from sticking. I'm also going to add some full garam masalas, two green cardamoms, two black cardamoms, some mace, three to four cloves, a cinnamon stick and a bay leaf. And I'm going to mix all this together. Okay. Now one thing that I like to do is I like potato in my biryani. So I'm also going to add some potato because I want the potato to catch some of the flavors as well. So I add some potato in as well. And I want everything to be coated in the mixture. But it doesn't end there. To this we're going to add some fried onions. Now you can buy these ready in the market or you can just fry them at home. It's basically deep fried in ghee. Though if you're a little health conscious, you can use oil like I did. Though I don't really think that helps. So you add half of your onions and this adds a delicious flavor. And I'm going to lastly add some yogurt. This is about uh, 200 grams of yogurt. And now you mix all of this together. And I also like to add a touch of freshly ground black pepper. And there you have it. Our mutton is marinated and we're going to put this away in the fridge for a good two hours at least. So now that our mutton is marinating, it's time to prepare the rice for our biryani. Now, the couple of things to keep in mind. If you're using a really large dish to make your biryani and you're going to have a lot of rice on it, then you need to cook the rice in two batches, one at about 40%, one at about 60%. However, I'm one of those people that likes equal rice and equal mutton. So I'm only going to be cooking up 250 grams of rice and therefore I will cook it to about 50%. Now I've got some water on the stove and I'm going to add some salt to this. So after adding the salt, I'm going to add some shahi jeera or black cumin. I'm going to add some whole garam masalas like a cinnamon stick 
and a bay leaf. I will also add one green cardamom and one black cardamom. And you also got to make sure that you soak the rice for at least 40 minutes before cooking it. I however choose to soak it for about an hour or two if possible. And the rice will cook really fast. So in about three to four minutes your rice will be half done. And that's the time you need to stop the cooking. Because otherwise you will have overcooked rice in your biryani and it will just be mushy. And you can also put a little bit of oil in the water to keep the rice from sticking. But don't overdo it otherwise you will get oily rice. So as you can see our water is boiling now and we are going to put our rice into it. So the rice is about done now. Definitely 50% cooked. We are going to go and strain it and then add it to our biryani. So now it's time to cook the biryani. And we've got one of these saucepans here. Make sure you get a fairly large one with a heavy lid. Uh, but there are a couple of tricks that I'm going to show you along the way because mine neither has a heavy base nor does it have a heavy lid. And I'm going to make that proper dum biryani with the atta around it and all that jazz, you know. So we're going to start assembling the biryani by putting the mutton into the pan. Now we add the rice on top of the mutton. And because my pan is not very deep, like I said, I've cooked the rice only 50%. But if you have a deeper dish, then you'd want to do one batch of rice at 50% and one a little more cooked because it cooks unevenly otherwise. Make sure you spread the rice out nicely. Now it doesn't end here. There's more flavorings and things to be added. So you take some ghee first of all and just drop little pockets of it and this will melt in and be delicious. Next we add some of those fried onions. Add some of the fresh mint leaves. Add some fresh coriander and just spread this. Now we're going to add something called keura, which you can buy in a little bottle. Don't put too much of this. This is just for an aromatic effect. Just a few drops and that's enough. And our last and final ingredient, saffron. So I've just taken a little bit of milk, warmed it and put the saffron in that. As you can see, it's got a lovely color from the saffron and just pour that around. So our biryani has been cooking for about three to four minutes now on a medium to high heat. And if you look carefully, there is some steam coming out. I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to put this frying pan underneath that and turn the flame down. So we're going to put this on the frying pan and put that on the heat. So there's one final step to complete our dumb biryani. And that is to seal the saucepan with some atta or dough, which is made from wheat flour and water. Now the purpose of this is to keep all the steam in and let the biryani cook in that steam. If you have a heavy lid, then you will not need to do this, you know, but since my lid is not heavy, I got to do this. So just roll it out and seal it. You want to make sure that none of that steam escapes. And you will see at the end that this dough will actually cook and become hard around the dish. So now that I've sealed in our biryani, we're just going to put it on a really low flame and let it cook for about 40 to 45 minutes. And that's where I need my trusty stopwatch. So set the clock and in about 40 to 45 minutes, your biryani will be perfect. So as you can see, it's been almost 45 minutes and we're just going to turn the gas off and let the biryani sit for another 15 minutes. Then we'll open it up. All right, our biryani is done now and it's time to open the lid. So we're going to pull off this atta. 
Whoa. Holy smokes. So now I'm going to just put our biryani in this nice looking dish and serve it up. And you can finish it off with a little bit of fresh coriander and mint on the top. And it's perfect. So here it is, a delicious demanufactured mutton biryani. And I can't wait for Fear Factory to come and taste this. Hey and welcome back to Headbangers Kitchen. My guests are here with me today and they are the most legendary band. One of my biggest influences in my early days as a young metalhead. I have Dino and Burton from Fear Factory with me. Hello. It is Thanks nice. Yeah, nice to be here. Awesome. It's so such an honor to have you guys on the show. Uh, you have just played the NH7 Weekender in Pune. How was the experience? Was India everything that you expected it to be? I didn't have any expectation. I didn't know what to expect. Being that I've never been here before, but uh, I was really surprised that people were really singing along to all the songs. It, was, yeah. it blew me away, actually. It, you know, we've never been here before, and uh, it was quite exciting. And uh, it's been a really cool experience being here. I would never. I never thought that I would. We would be over here in India playing. You know, the only experience I've ever had of India is just the stuff I've seen other bands put on their DVDs or their, you know. Uh, you know, like when Meshuggah was here or Lamb of God was here. That's really the only time I've ever seen anybody in India. And then so I heard some good things, I heard some bad things, but we were here and everything's been great. Uh, people are really nice um, and uh, the food is amazing, of course. And uh, so I'm, I'm just happy to be here. Awesome. So did you get to see any of the local metal bands? Uh, yes, we came out and peaked a few times because I always want, because they, they were actually really good. And, I was like, oh yeah, the, these guys are pretty good. I didn't, I didn't really get the names, or yeah. I heard, I heard the names, but I didn't remember. And some of them came backstage, and we met some of the local bands. Yeah, the band and that was cool. Us, um, they would have probably been Bayanak Moth. That's what it was. They are very there nice was. guys, and they're they're really cool live too. So let's talk a little bit about Fear Factory. It's okay. It's been twenty four years now, I think. Yeah. Since you guys started. Twenty four years. Yeah, and I mean. Your history is amazing. I mean, if you go on Wikipedia, you could spend like an hour just going through it. But what kind of inspired you guys back in the day to form a band, you know, and what sort of influenced your sound then, you know, because it was so unique. It was uh, something that kind of had not been done before. You know? Yeah, you're right. Um, we kind of started out in the local bands, band scene, not metal scene, more of like, uh, I would say a cross between Godflesh, your cost between alternative kind of grungy type stuff and then me and him met along the way and then we started a band called Oceration and we were kind of like a, a really slow Godflesh. We took the groovy parts of Godflesh and just made a whole demo of that and then um, later on I met some of the other guys and then we just we, we me and him started Fear Factory and then we brought some of the other guys in and that's kind of like how it started but our love, for, our love for music, and the, you know, you know, Dean and I, you know, we grew up knowing that this is what we wanted to do with our lives, and so that's that, the inspiration was just the love of music, and it's called all, lifers. Yeah, lifers. We're lifers. That's all yeah. I ever wanted to do, really. And you know, obviously, most people look at you guys as a big band, you know, uh, but what is it really being a musician, especially a metal musician today? You know, given the way. The industry has changed the way you know everything has changed for music, and you have seen that change, you know, right from mm -hmm. the nineties till now. So, mm -hmm. how easy or hard has it actually been to be a full-time musician? It's not easy, not easy. It's hard work um, because the industry has changed. We have to work harder to survive because this is our livelihood. This is how we survive, so we have to work even harder. Um, no one, no one really buys albums anymore, except the metal fans are truly the only ones buying albums these days. Country artists. Country artists. Yeah. <laughs> I mean country. Because none of those country people know how to work the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the metal community is definitely very supportive of the CD buying or the special packaging type of stuff. But definitely you have to adapt, you have to change, you have to figure out, you have to scale things down. Production, you know, scales down. Uh, crew scale down. You have to figure out a way to, to make it to balance it out. We always travel with the skeleton crew nowadays, just to 
to cover, you know, to keep the costs low. Because even in the industry, um, even uh, you know, our, our guarantees, which is like how we are able to tour, yeah. you know, even those are, you know, are changing. So, um, but, you know, that touring life is how an artist, or a metal artist survives these days. You know? Touring t-shirts. We're not all Dave Grohl. I wish we could be, <laughs> but <laughs> God bless his soul. He's a, you know, talented person, but uh, he's very fortunate in his career. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, there's always, you know, a few bands they really don't have to, you know, work as hard, you know, because yeah. some guy, some some artists just get lucky. That's just how it is, you know what I mean. But most of us, we have to really work hard. Like I said, we have to adapt to the way the industry is changing. Um, and for any new artist, you know, the, it's it's hard work. For any new artist coming out, it's hard work. Just because you're signed doesn't mean you're going to be an instant rock star. Yeah, a lot of a lot of dudes have that misconception. Still. Yeah, I've, I've had other project bands where I've had younger guys in the band. They think, okay, I'm in a band with Dino Cazares. Wow, we're going to be big, and we're going to get this, and we're going to get the best catering, and we're going to make a lot of money, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but you got to work. you got to work at it, you know what I mean? It's just like an older guy, like your father, trying to teach you the values of money and how to work for it and how to earn it. That's kind of like what these, some of these artists, kind of, some of these newer artists, they forget that. You know what I mean? Are they maybe they never learned that, or I don't know. They just their misconception is that you know they're going to be banging chicks every night, or they're going to be you know, uh, you know, just signing autographs all day. No, you got to put the gear in the trailer. You got to bust your ass, and you really got to go out there and work. Yeah, and uh, you know, they they you know these younger kids, you know, kids, um, you know, they haven't been through the twenty four years that we have and seen this whole industry change and been through what, you know, we were in the van with a trailer, not even a trailer, a van with a gear and a, a mattress <laughs> on the floor, on the van on the floor, you know, and we, we, we started, that's where we started. It was a cargo van full of mattresses. Whoa. That's crazy. <laughs> that's yeah. how you do it. That's how you have to do it, you know, it's like. But, you know, we, Dean and I have experienced the beginnings of how to start rough, and, uh, you know, it's, times are still rough, you know, yeah, things are, can be, can be a little bit better but still you know we have to work hard but the positive outlook is if you work hard at it you can prosper from it and one of the other one of the main things that uh, the one of the main things of the best the best thing is you get to play the music that you love and you get to play in front of the people that appreciate your music that's the best thing yeah. that's the reward at the end of the yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. the best part yes. of the, day, the best part of the day of touring is playing the show the show of course yeah all right, so speaking of industry myths, you know, uh, you mentioned about being signed to Roadrunner. Like, what exactly does that, how does that work for you? Do you? Is that like the ticket out or is it the ticket to stardom or is it just, you know? Well, it used to be. I mean, um, you know, <laughs> when labels, in a time when labels would actually support bands with, uh, you know, give you a decent uh, recording budget, give you a decent video budget, give you a decent touring support. Um, give me decent promotion and marketing. Um, those those times have changed. You know, even because the industry has changed, the labels have to change, and they're cutting back too. And so, majorly, you know, majorly. And so, they have, you know, the, those budgets have been slashed seventy five percent. How true is the late night partying and the groupies and all that stuff? Is there any truth to that? No. Well, <laughs> I went through that. I went through a lot of that in my, you know, the middle of our career. I went through a lot of that. Long yeah. time ago, you know, when we were younger. Late yeah. 90s, late 90s. It was, we were riding high. Yeah. You know what I mean? We were younger. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, uh, but late night parties, you know, you can only do so much these days. Um, you know, we all have families now that, you know, we have to have a responsibility. But uh, even that has changed a lot. Um, people have been becoming more responsible. There's... To me, I don't think there's any such shady groupies anymore. No. I mean, there's the one or two, but... <laughs> that well has dried up, too. That's dried up. Well, I'll put it this way. You know, back in the groupie days, I was looking for it. Uh, now, since I've been married for nine years, I don't look for it. So, I don't, you know, I'm sure it's there. I just don't go. I don't make myself available for that no. as I used to be. Interesting. 
Yeah. All right. So, um, I want to talk a little bit more about you know Fear Factory back in the day. What okay. kind of inspired the whole clean voice and the the he- you know the uh, heavy singing and, and that contrast? You know, because it was never done. Back that in was the day. somebody that that was something that we stumbled across, kind of, because when I first met him, we were uh, it, we, you know we were just starting up in Hollywood and you know living really cheap and expensive, almost on the street kind of, but we there was this house, a seven bedroom house. And a friend of ours um, was renting the house, so he rented each room to different artists. Right. Bert was one of the guys. I was one of the guys. We didn't really even know each other that, at that point. Yeah. But I heard him singing in the shower. And two guys like, from my other band were living there, and that's why I moved in. Yeah. And so I didn't walk in the shower. Somebody, <laughs> somebody goes, oh, did you go in the shower with him to hear him singing? No. I was walking by the shower, and I could hear who's singing, and it was him. And so... One day when we were doing Fear Factory, he, you know, we were doing a death metal voice, obviously that heavy growl, and I, I just, out of the blue, I said, hey, oh no, he sang something. Because he, he was playing a chord that was different from what, yeah. you know, the normal stuff we were playing, and I was like, oh, you know, something, so and, something just came out. And so he just sang something, and I'm like, what, <laughs> what was that? Do it again, do it again, and then like, it just, it just stuck. Yeah, because I mean that has become the blueprint for so many subgenres of metal. Thank you for thank you for recognizing that. Thank you. Because a lot of people, a lot of websites, a lot of people, they don't recognize where it came. They don't know where it came from. There's so many bands that's come out, like newer school bands. Yeah. They think maybe you know, I don't want to, like bands like Kill Switch or somebody else came up with it. No, it was like Fear no. Factory came up with it back in the day. I remember yeah. because I had all your albums, and I specifically that was the thing, and that is still today what I do in my band. No. I had your poster from Metal Hammer with the T-Rex hands. Uh, <laughs> that was on my wall for That's cool. many years. That's cool. You know, Here you are today in my living room. You know, it's a, you know, when Dino and I started working together, we all, you know, we, he had a, he had music that I, he, he liked, and I had music that we liked, and we were introducing each other to all different types of music, and you know, I I just liked you know a lot of music I liked had that type of melody or just type of you know, vocal style in it, but it wasn't what I had done. I interpreted it into my own type of thing. Yeah, and it was funny because when our first album came out, you know, uh, you know, we were considered like a sort of industrial death metal band, or, yeah. right? And so a lot of the death metal fans got into it, you know, and a lot of them said this first thing, you know, it's like, you know, yeah, I heard, you know, right, right when I heard Martyr, it was the first song people heard, Martyr. Like all of a sudden the clean vocals came on. He goes, "What the fuck is this shit?" <laughs> but then they would tell me like they heard a few times like, "Oh man, this is this is amazing." So, you know, at first we got a lot of shit for it, but then after a while, people started to really like it until like, "Wow, this this works." Yeah. Like you know, I think we were the first band to say that this could work, and I think everybody just took off with it and yeah, started absolutely. making it their own. You know what I mean? Yeah. And even your style of riffing, especially back in the day, which to me is what actually laid the foundation for a lot of what metal is doing today. The whole kick drum and the right hand locking. Yeah. Like what kind of, again, inspired your guitar playing or to sort of take that route? Because again, that was not something that anyone was really doing. Couple of, right? A couple of things. Like industrial music is one of the things to it because it's like, it's the repetitive nature of his riff, but it's also how it's synced up with the riff, with the beat. And so the beat follows the riff. And he's like, he's screaming the beat. So it's like, you know, the riff is the beat. And so it's, uh, it's basically it's like to me it's a very industrial style. It's like it's, a, it's a, like a machine. Um, there was a couple of things, you know, like even like you know early, really early industrial bands, um, and like uh, even some even some hip hop bands. You know, they sample they sample a riff, not necessarily not necessarily a heavy riff. It could be any riff, but they sample it, and you can literally hear where it loops. You know. To, like, it could be anything, whatever, you know. And then they sample, you hear it loop. I was like, I always wanted to copy that, but I wanted to play it. And so that's where I developed the stop-start thing, right? And then when Metallica did the song one, the middle part, that one, yeah. darkness has not I'm like, oh, that's the only time I ever heard him do that. Yeah. I'm like, sick riff. I made a whole career out of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Just that one little piece. I was like, that's it. Everything on the kick drum has got to follow the guitar. 
all of it. And that's kind of like how it went. That's awesome. Yeah. And you also didn't play too much of uh, lead guitar because I remember specifically, I think it was you and Max that kind of inspired me to not bother with solos. <laughs> solos. But then I did see you play a solo in Divine Heresy. Yes. Um, I think that for Fear Factory, it just didn't fit, you know, because we didn't, we weren't a normal heavy metal band, you know, or whatever you want to call us. We weren't a normal band in that way. We were introducing new things, um, you know, from the melodic vocals to the beautiful keyboards and just the heavy rips, you know, very staccato riffing, you know, kick drum syncing. I just, there was times, most of the time, we didn't write, sp we didn't write parts for a solo. You know, other bands write parts for solos. solos. Yeah, we didn't write parts for solos, and it sounded cool. You know, there was a lot of grindcore bands back in the day that didn't do solos, and kind of we were kind of a little bit influenced by that. And it was like um, in Hollywood, you know, when I first got into Hollywood when I was 17 years old, there was a lot, there was a school there, and all the dudes wanted to be like Steve Vai, <laughs> and I was like, fuck those dudes, I wanted to be, I want just want to write riffs, and so it was kind of like a rebellionist. Rebelliousness, I don't know how to say it, but rebelliousness, how do you say that? Rebellious. Yeah, rebellious. yeah, rebellious attitude towards all those dudes that were like, woo, woo, woo. and so I just like, screw those guys, and I just wanted to play riffs, and that's kind of like how it went. But has your perception kind of changed over the years? Do you play any solos now? Just even if it's on mm, your own? Yeah, on my own I do, and I did it in some other bands, yeah. Divine Heresy, of course, and even Asesino, I did solos, only because I wrote parts for it, and it fit. Whereas Fear Factory, yeah. and I also think that we influenced bands not to do that because later on Deftones didn't do solos, Korn didn't do solos, a lot of bands didn't do solos. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I noticed is, is there was a lot of uh, instability over the years in your lineup. You know, you left the band for some point, and there were many differences. So what kind of brought it all back together? You know, him. <laughs> That's how life goes, man. People come in and out of your life. You know, friendships never really end. They just kind of have like a, you know, a break. And uh, sometimes that has to happen. And, you know, instability is not, you know, it's not a, a, a unique thing to our band. It's, it happens in every band, you know. It's, and uh, I don't know why our band has like, had a lot more exposure over our instability, but there's been bands that had even more instability. You know, to me, just, you know, Sabbath. Sabbath, you know, Slayer, Judas Priest, you know, just, uh, yeah, but there was a lot, of, Mac. A lot of press, <laughs> <there. Yeah. laughs> but a lot of press, I remember when Raymond and Christians played, yeah, there was a lot of press, that's what you're saying, he doesn't know why yeah. we had, there was a lot more spoken, and you had the same problem with Divine Heresy when I think uh, yeah. Tommy quit, you know, so how do you deal well, with no, all this? Well, no, Tommy never quit, he got fired. Yeah, he got fired, yes. Yes. it's because of, you know, it's because of the internet. It's, it's because, because what I said earlier, I'm sorry. Because what I said earlier, where I said, guys have a misperception of they think they're going to come into a band and not work and think it's all party, fun, and games. If somebody's not going to work, they got to go. That's basically what it is. But how do you deal with all the press that comes out, the negative backlash because of it? Even if you, know, you are in the right... You have, to deal with it. you have to deal with it like a man. Deal with it, you you know. have to deal with it like a man. If somebody's going to ask you, you answer the question. The more you get annoyed by it, the more people are going to feed on that. And they're going to ask you, they're going to make yeah. a dumber story about it. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. You know, it's, this is my life. I own it. And that's it. You know, then you're not the one that has to live with it. I live with it. I know how I, I come to terms with it. That's, not, that's how I do it. You know, if they care, that's not my problem. And uh, do you know, this is a question I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you about divine mercy. Uh -huh. Right now, there is a bit of controversy because there's supposed to be two of them now. So. No. Is Divine Heresy still on? Are we going to see any new material? Uh, from me, yes. And who else is in Divine Heresy right now? It doesn't matter at the point at this point. So right now it's just you. Yes. Well, well that's really what it was. Well, there really the is beginning. No, there can't be any Divine Heresy without the team. And uh, do you have any side projects currently, or I? I got a project called The Watchers, but it's you know it's something that's completely different, and you know it's more of a artistic and you know uh, more of a <laughs> artistic, it's all like an artistic endeavor. So it's nothing's really happening with that. Right now. I have some new songs, but nothing really. I'm not focused on Fear Factory right now. 
And uh, I believe you guys just cancelled the European tour that you had scheduled for next year. Yeah. Uh, so why has that happened? And we postponed it. Okay. Well, we moved it. Because we have to finish this album. Okay, so yeah, the album has to be done. We're behind, so we got to so get it done. So what can fans expect on this new album? Is there anything they should be looking out for? Um, you know, it's going to be, you know, if, if you're a fan of Fear Factory, it's, I think what to expect is uh, probably some of the more better crafted songs we've done in a long, long time. Nice. It's going to be a lot more riffs with kick drums. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty I look But fast to picking, a lot of fast picking, a lot of uh, right hand. A lot of right hand stuff. A lot of it. I really look forward so, to the new album. And if you're a, good, a guy trying to learn that stuff, it's more about endurance. Endurance. Yeah. Endurance. You know, it's not going to be hard. It's just the endurance playing, you know, four to five minutes of, you know, yeah. takes a while. Awesome. awesome. So let's talk a little bit uh, about something different, you know. Um, sure. Let's talk about food now, since we are a food show. So what do you guys like to eat and what is your favorite food? I think I'm obvious. <laughs> Mexican, <laughs> Mexican food. You know, I, I like all types of food. You know, as long as it's flavorful, um, you know, and, uh, just make me feel good. So I just like to try everything. But I have my top foods that I like. Of course, number one, Mexican. Number two is Thai. Three is Indian. Um, four is Italian, and five is just like the typical American food, like pizza, burgers, burgers hot dogs. But all those foods I just mentioned always have to have something spicy with it. Serrano peppers, jalapeno peppers, something with it. You know what I mean? So even if I eat a sandwich, yeah. a cheese sandwich, I'm going to have <coughs> some jalapenos with it. So what's the spiciest thing you've ever eaten? A ghost chili pepper. <laughs> and and uh, going back to music, uh, what, what are you guys listening to these days? Because you know? a lot of metal musicians don't actually listen to metal, surprisingly. I listen to a lot of metal. I mean, from from hair metal to speed metal to thrash metal, death metal, grindcore, whatever, whatever kind of metal. It's because I always like to keep. Um, sometimes you know, it's it's the stuff that inspires me. I still like to listen to, you know. Um, and sometimes I want to hear new stuff to see what new people are doing, what new bands are doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I love bands like Animal Leaders and Born of Osiris and you know bands like Coldplay and bands like that. A lot of the new school stuff that's coming. Yeah. The last few years. What about you, buddy? What's on your playlist? I was listening to the latest Mark Lanigan band record. I'm not sure who that is. Neither am I. He was uh, he was on the Screaming Trees. Oh, okay. Uh, I but, heard uh, the name of But Mark, Mark Lanigan, he's been his own artist for a long time, and then his new record just came out, so I've been kind of checking that out. Nice. And uh, do you have any hobbies? Besides uh, playing music, you said. Well, music playing is not a hobby, right? It's your life. You. Uh, well, you can still do it as a hobby. You can jam with your buddies. As a f yeah, yeah. Kind of so, a well, do you have anything that you like to do apart from playing music? No. no. I mean, yes. No. <laughs> um, I race RC cars, remote control cars. Yeah. That's my hobby. Um, I like to do photography and I uh, raise my kids. <laughs> That's a hobby. That's a, hobby. <laughs> That's a rough hobby. <laughs> so, what's next for you guys on the cards now? Uh, it's finishing the record and then doing massive touring around the world you know Europe uh, South America Australia obviously the US um, Japan come back to Asia. hopefully yeah. come back here awesome and um, is there any message that you'd like to give your fans here in India <laughs> uh, thank you for supporting us and thank you for uh, Coming out to see Fear Factory, if you had the opportunity, uh, it's been a long time coming and hopefully it won't be the last. Awesome. Can't wait to see everybody in Delhi and I'm sure we will be back soon. Awesome. So on that note, are you gentlemen ready to taste what I have made for I'm you? I'm ready. Yes. So what I have cooked for you is a demanufactured mutton biryani. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yes. So I was told lamb is something you like to eat. Yeah, we like lamb. Yes, but in India we don't get lamb. Oh, it's mutton. So we, mutton yeah. Oh, okay. So I've made a mutton biryani for you. That's of course demanufactured. And uh, <laughs> let's go get that demanufactured mutton biryani. All right, guys. So here it is, the demanufactured mutton biryani with a bundi raita for you. 
that's yogurt basically seasoned with indian spices Sweet. and dino two green chili specifically for you to keep the heat level up <laughs> there it goes dig in guys nice okay i'll let you know bon appetit mm oh that's brilliant mm that's good this is really good very tasty wow the mutton is very very um delicate it's like it just kind of melts in your mouth i love the rice there's a little bit of potato in here right yep yeah it's so nice how do you say this Raita. Raita is delicious. Okay, I'll try this. It's basically like yogurt. It's yogurt. That's delicious. Thank you. With, with the mutton, it's perfect. And the biryani uh, mm. is delicious. What's the crunchy stuff in there? That's uh, a fried thing called bundi. Nice. Okay, so you get a whole bunch of flavors and textures. You can put some spice in there too? Yeah, of course. Just kidding. <laughs> If you want to chop a green chili, you can do that. <laughs> That's love it. <laughs> it looks like I have to pull out a few more now. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's really good. The meat is very tender. It's awesome. Thank you, guys. It's delicious. Good work. So there you have it. Fear Factory has given the thumbs up to the demanufactured mutton biryani, and we'll see you on the next episode of Headbangers Kitchen. Awesome. You said a pizza, right? Yeah. How do you do that? It's like a pie. Yeah, it's actually yeah, pretty much. Is that next? Yeah, as in that's now generally the lunch. Ah, okay. <laughs> This is the camera lunch. <laughs> that's all camera. Well, it's quite good. You should put put a meat sub here too. <laughs> Why not? Put a meat sub, yeah. Meat sub, meat sub. Meat sub, meat sub.